Overbooked, Utah doctors are doing double duty to help the overflow of future missionaries. Feel the burn. This sushi spot is known for its super spicy rolls. Are you up for the challenge? And East Coast cleanup. The aftermath of Superstorm Sandy leaves millions on the mend. I'm Sean Gordon. And I'm Lauren Simpson. It's Thursday, November 1st, and in Utah, it's 12 o'clock. From KBYU and the BYU Department of Communications, Award-winning 11 News at Noon. The BYU Health Center is filling up on people wanting physicals now that church members can serve missions at a younger age. 11 News reporter Sarah Clark is in the newsroom. Sarah, how has the change maxed out the appointment book? Sean, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints says there are almost 600 missionaries that are filling their applications. But these for local for local doctors means double the work, six times the work. Phones at the BYU Health Center are ringing off the hook. Since the LDS Church lowered the ages when people can serve missions, more than ever are trying to get a mission prep examination. The day after conference was over, so Monday, I come in at seven. The phone rang nonstop. Those early birds were able to beat the rush and get appointments, but others like Amy Smith took longer to decide to call. I called the health center and I got an appointment, but it was like three weeks out and I am not that patient. The health center says they used to have fewer than 10 mission physicals a week, and now they have more than 100. The earliest these future missionaries can get an appointment for physicals is the last week of November. If they want a specific doctor, it might get even harder. Some of the general practitioners are booked out clear until January. This has made some impatient future missionaries to look for other solutions. I could not wait that long, so I had to call around here in Provo, and um, I got my appointments about a week and a half later. The health center also says that they are saving some space for those people that might need a doctor, but they don't need it for other reasons. And they also brought in another nurse to help speed up the process. In the newsroom, Sarah Clark, 11 News. Sounds like they need at least one new nurse. Thanks, Sarah. LDS missionaries all along the East Coast are trading suits and ties for jeans and t-shirts to help out their storm-damaged neighbors. They worked with other volunteers to remove trees from rooftops and to clear debris that Superstorm Sandy left behind. Church leaders say cleanup efforts will continue over the next few days and then they'll start tackling more long-term projects. At a frightening Halloween discovery last night, the body of a missing Mill Creek man. 80-year-old Fritz Helen went missing last Wednesday. and hiker in Neffs Canyon found his body near a creek around sunset last night. Police say evidence shows Helen likely fell off a trail and tumbled down a steep hill, but they don't expect foul, suspect foul play. And police in Richfield want people to know that a racially charged letter placed on people's doorsteps didn't come from them. It tells people that an African-American family is moving into the neighborhood, and those who oppose what it calls int an intrusion should sign a petition. The forged letter ended up on nine doors and claims to be from the city's neighborhood watch program. Now that it's November, we get to set our clocks back an hour this Sunday, which means you get back the hour you lost last spring. 11 News reporter London Clausen is live in the newsroom. London, are students thinking about what to do with the extra time? Yes, Lauren, with homework and midterms and the chaos of just being a normal college student can, and we all do need a lot of time. When I was talking to these students, they said that setting their clock back can make a difference. I don't know, just hanging out with family, spending time with my wife, and just hanging out. <laughs> Probably sleep. <laughs> I'm really sleep deprived right now, so I'm like, whoo, extra hour, more sleep. <laughs> Helps you kind of stay alert throughout the day. Instead of feeling tired and wanting to take a nap during that hour, it can just keep working, keep uh, doing homework, and getting good grades in class. The more time I have to do homework, the better, so, you know. That extra hour, I probably will just work, you know, get a, get a little extra study time in. I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's especially with, like, finals coming up pretty soon, it's like I got to really, really pound the books and get, you know, hit the library, maybe hang out there a little bit longer. And 
Well, we actually have a volleyball court in our backyard, and so hopefully I can get some more people together because everyone's been studying, and like in that whole extra hour, we can work on volleyball. So that'd be really fun. Students that don't remember to set their block clocks back can miss certain gatherings, such as church and family gatherings. In the newsroom, London Clawson, 11 News. Thanks, London. Do you know what you're going to be doing with your extra hour? With all the papers I've had do, had do, I'll probably just take a nap or something. I'm so tired. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. Me too. Thanks, London. <laughs> Thank you. When 11 News at noon returns. Scorching sushi. Some of the hottest rolls in the world are made right here in Utah. Will they make you cry? And cougars in costume. BYU fans usually dress in blue and white. But at this volleyball game, everyone looks like they were about to go trick-or-treating. Would you believe that some of the world's spiciest sushi is right here in Utah? 11 News reporter Alexis Flake takes us to the Salt Lake restaurant that's home to the Hellfire Challenge, where eating sushi really could mean life or death. As soon as I put it in my mouth, I kind of thought, oh no, it's, you know, it's begun. And once you start, there's no going back. College student Wesley Eames says he came to Kobe Sushi for one thing, the Hellfire Challenge. We are all so proud of you. I'm an advocate for spice in just about everything, but I've never had anything this spicy. This is, this is insane. Sushi chef Alex Chang says his challenge rolls up the spiciest sushi in the world. And if you want your face on this wall, you've got to sign a waiver and put your health in his nimble hands. So far during the four years, we get about 5,600 people did a challenge and about 230 people passed the challenge. That's about 4%. Facing the challenge means eating sushi rolls that increase in spice until most people can't stand the heat. Evil always have an angel face. Chef Chang's spice scale ranges from levels 4 to 10, and no one has made it past his level 8. What makes this challenge so difficult is this sauce. Sushi chefs have to wear special heavy-duty gloves to protect their skin because any time this sauce touches them, it can burn them for up to 12 hours. That secret weapon is a combination of the hottest peppers on the planet, and so far it's sent nearly 30 people to the hospital. Eames is determined to come out on top or at least on the wall. But after 20 minutes of burning, sweating, and just plain pain, he taps out before level eight, swallowing enough of level seven to get his picture posted. I am crying, I was crying, and probably will continue to cry. And those tears come from pain and joy. You're a good man. Eames says he's not giving up, but level eight will have to wait until after he recovers. In Salt Lake City, Alexis Flake, 11 News. Wow, that is intense. Chef Chang says the best training for his challenge is eating spicy foods at home without drinking water or milk for at least 30 minutes afterwards. As much as I like spicy foods, I'm not going to try that. But on to the nation. National Guard troops evacuate a New York hospital. Cleanup on the East Coast continues and a border hopping fail. Here's your news at look from across the nation. National Guard troops evacuated more than 700 patients from New York's Bellevue Hospital. Soldiers lined the stairwells, forming what they called a human bucket brigade. The hospital became unsafe when Superstorm Sandy knocked out the hospital's power and flooding in the basement broke the fuel pumps which run the generators. The hospital will reopen once electricians restore power. And cleanup continued for millions after Superstorm Sandy ripped through the Northeast. Crews began clearing hundreds of trees that took out power lines and blocked several major roads. More than 2 million people are still without power and running water, but New York City did reopen the subways this morning, which will help clear up the bridges and streets of the Big Apple. And U.S. Border Patrol agents watching this attempt to illegally cross into Arizona call it an epic fail. Suspected smugglers built a ramp against the 14-foot fence, but when they tried to drive their Jeep over the top, it got stuck. The suspects then jumped out of the car and ran back into Mexico, leaving agents to remove the Jeep and the ramp. And that's your look at news from across the nation. Lauren? Thanks, Sean. It's pretty normal to spend time on Facebook liking things and asking people to be your friends. But would you consider doing these things in real life? 11 News reporter Julianne Horsley shows us how one BYU student is taking Facebook at face value. I am connected to this digital world. I'm obsessed with this culture just as much as everybody else. <laughs> Josh Wilson loves and uses Facebook just like any other college student. I've had many hours where I've 
stayed up late, um, being excited about receiving those friend requests, um, messaging my friends, doing all those different things that are really ultimately not very productive. Can I distract you for a second? But this time, he's taking his obsession of liking objects and making friends off the screen. I'm inviting people to be my friend. I formally request you to be my friend. I ask you to be my friend. Would you accept my friend request? <laughs> Josh decided to take the social networking phenomenon and turn it into one big social experiment. Josh came in, made a friend request, and I confirmed it. What were you thinking? Um, I thought he was a pretty nice guy, kind of bored. Josh has handed out over 1,300 friend requests and liked over 200 objects, not just on Facebook, but on living touchable things. When you start doing these things online, it seems pretty normal, but when you start doing these things in real life, it can get pretty awkward. Excuse me, I really like you. Would you like to be my friend? Um, sure. It's not every day that you make a new friend, and it's not every day that you have a friend actually approach you and formally ask you or invite you to be their friend. And so I wanted to just take that idea and twist it and try to do those things in real life. But after all the liking, posting, and friend requesting, why did he choose to parody Facebook? It's not weird for us to spend hours and hours online, going through each other's pictures, writing on each other's walls, making new friends online. But once you start doing these things in real life, for some reason or another, this becomes weird and this becomes absurd. And I wanted to know why. Josh's curiosity isn't the only inspiration behind the experiment. He said the impact from the distractions and abuse of social media caused him to search further into the network's influence on people. I've been the product of having my identity stolen online. And I know how scary of a thing that is when somebody's pretending to be you, when somebody has pictures of you and they're talking to people as if they are you. Josh wants people to not only reassess their online habits, but maintain human contact and human relationships. We can write on 100 people's walls all in the same hour, but you can't do those things in real life. Yeah. I just want to formally ask you to be my friend. On Facebook? Yeah. In Provo, Julianne Horsley, 11 News. <laughs> nice to meet you. And don't be surprised if Josh comes up to you and asks you to be his friend. Facebook boy, a name Josh has picked up, says he'll continue with the experiment until the end of this year. So Ariel, we had some lovely weather last night for trick-or-treaters. What can we expect in the future? You know what we did, Lauren, and in fact, we had some beautiful weather for our trick-or-treaters last night, but I sent the change. So stay with us and we'll let you know what the weather is going to be like this weekend. You're November 1st. I don't know about you guys, but it seems like it's taken a while to get finally to November. I'm so excited for the holiday season. But today in Provo, we have some clear skies and it's not like it was nice and warm yesterday. We have similar temperatures today. Right now we're at about 52 degrees, 50 percent humidity and a calm wind speed. Um, we're going to, um, what to expect tonight, we're going to have mostly cloudy skies um, a south breeze and few showers um, at different parts of the state, but here in Provo tonight with a low of 39 and mostly cloudy, um, our sunset at 6.23 p.m. Um, taking a look at the bigger picture, we have more clouds moving in from this northwest low front that is dropping our temperatures towards the latter part of the day. So tonight and earlier tomorrow, we'll have some cooler temperatures from this cold front, um, but like I said, not till later on today. Um, this front will stretch and cause storms throughout parts of the Wasatch Northern mo Mountains and different parts of Nevada and Idaho. So just cooler temperatures and um, highs across the state. We have Logan at 64 um, and St. George at 75. But our southern part of the state, it has plenty of sun. Um, typical seasonal temperatures for what we should be expecting uh, on our first day of November. Um, eastern Utah, um, sunny and clouds. Um, western Utah, sun and clouds too. And northern Utah, breezy, lower, temperature, lower temperatures than we've been seeing. But throughout the day, those temperatures will eventually drop. So these are our highs, but those temperatures will be dropping in different parts of northern Utah. Dixie five-day forecast. We have mostly cloudy today, 77 and 46. And then we see Friday, partly cloudy, 76 and 46. You see Saturday, Sunday, Monday, sunny, and up to 81 on Monday. So we'll have a beautiful weekend to look forward to down in Dixie and take a look at our northern Utah five-day forecast. 
Thursday, 6944. Friday, 6241. And as you can see throughout the rest of the week, throughout the week, we have sun. Um, so just a little temperature drop from that cold front coming in. But 62, 63, 64 for our highs, then 40, 40 two and 43 for our lows. So a great weekend to look forward to. And like I said, some typical weather that we should be ex expecting for November. Yeah, I was gonna say, it sounds like perfect late fall weather. Yeah, nice clear skies. Thanks, Ariel. So Clint, we don't have any BYD football to look forward to this week. But Halloween also meant the tip off of the Jazz, first season, or first game of the season. Yeah, Jazz fans really had an enjoyable game dressing up in Halloween costumes. In fact, the first 500 fans to get there in a costume got a free game ticket for a future game, so that's kind of nifty. Next on sports, basketball bash. How the Jazz fared against the Nowitzki list Mavericks in the season opener. And bump, set, spook. Halloween festivities showed up for the game, and the women dressed as volleyball players didn't disappoint. We'll check it out when we come back. Stay tuned. Women's volleyball gave us a treat on Halloween as the Cougars hope to trick the number 18 University of San Diego Toreros. The ladies looked good on the court, but the real sight was in the stands. Cougar fans, young and old, came decked out in their best costumes. They brought their wigs and wands along with their BYU pride. Costumes were adorable, funny, and some were quite scary and tried to intimidate the other team. Even the cheer squad got a zombie makeover. Jennifer Hampson stole the night, one block away from a triple-double with 15 kills, 12 digs, and 9 blocks. The Cougars won in four sets and play again on Saturday. Women's action continues tonight with a basketball home exhibition against Shadron State and an away soccer game versus Loyola Marymount. The basketball team welcomes back three returning starters and looks to improve on last year's 26-7 record and a trip to the NCAA tournament. Number four soccer is ranked the highest ever in team history with two games left in the season. BYU leads the series against LMU 2-1 and puts its 15-game unbeaten streak on the line. The Utah Jazz opened up their season against the Dallas Mavericks with a couple of new faces, both named Williams. Marvin and Moe step into the starting roles for Utah, who trailed early here courtesy of some good play by Vince Carter putting in the tray ball. They tied it up a little bit later on Marvin Williams' follow-up off of that, and then Derek Favors got the slam off the turnover. Dunk you very much. Dallas took the lead going into half as O.J. Mayo says, anything you can do, I can do better. Three-point buzzer beater, Dallas 63-55. Second half, the Williams fired things up, Marvin getting the easy fast break dunk, and Mo adding three of his own. Have some. Then on the break, Mo to Marvin for the pretty lay-in as Utah takes control of the game and cruises to a 113-94 victory. And the sudden trade of James Harden took everyone by surprise. The news finally sank in Wednesday night when the Rockets took on the Detroit Pistons. Harden, fresh off signing a five-year, $80 million deal, went to work early and often, absolutely filling it up. 37 points, 12 assists, six boards, and four steals. I wonder if the Thunder are rethinking their decision. He scored from anywhere and everywhere and propelled the Rockets to the 105-96 victory. The highly anticipated first game for the Brooklyn Nets in their new Barclays Center will just have to wait. New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg called off the game because of the devastation caused by Hurricane Sandy. The Nets franchise moved from New Jersey and spent $1 billion to build the arena. Their new season opener will be on Saturday against the Raptors. I've been on the outside of the Barclays Center, but I've heard that the inside is even more incredible. Looks beautiful. Yeah, it is good. And, uh, just found out that BYU football is actually going to be playing Cincinnati, a home and home, 2015 and 2016. That'll be a, that'll cool. be a fun game. Still to come on 11 News at Noon. Odd sights. Why is this dog reading philosophy while his friends read Dr. Seuss? It's all in good fun. We'll explain when we return.
If you see a dog reading a book in a library or a smiley face painted on a skating rink, you're probably seeing the work of a worldwide scavenger hunt. The Gishwas proje project gives teams unlikely scenarios to reenact, photograph, and then submit to an international website. Here you see BYU alums Maddie Nordgren and Emily Young of Provo taking at least 50 stuffed toys grocery stock shopping. Stunts have also included a chalk art representation of a philosophy principle and having a person in a stormtrooper costume clean a pool. Doesn't that look so fun? I know, yeah. Where, where's your stormtrooper costume? I'll get the stormtrooper costume if you can get the pool. Okay, I know a good one. And I'll get the dog and meet you at the library. <laughs> get the dog? Good, good, good. Uh, you got that, enough stuffed that animals? Me the chalk art or stuff <laughs> oh, yeah, there we go. The chalk art. You got to get that. There That's 11 News at noon for Thursday, November 1st. You can join us anytime on our website, 11news.byu.edu. And thanks for watching. Have a great afternoon.